Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. On this episode of the podcast, we have Peter Brett, author of the Demon Psycho series of books, uh, The Warded Man, and so on. Um, we had a great time talking to him, man. He's such a great guy, and uh, apparently he just loves Seattle, which I'm really excited about. He goes to Emerald City Comic Con every year, and uh, we've seen him there on a couple of panels, and we always have a good time listening to him and... Uh, can't wait to uh, talk to him next time. And um, anyway, it's going to be a great episode. Um, you're going to love it. Again, great guy. Um, we're brought to you, as always, by Amazon.com. Go to our website, gtfopodcast.com, and on the top left, on the main page, click on the Amazon banner. That'll take you to Amazon.com, where you can shop as you usually do. And Amazon kicks us back a little something-something, and that helps the podcast. And uh, just keep us able to do this stuff um and again we really appreciate it and uh thank you so much and now on with the program got your happy ending feel the excitement build show down in a ghost We oh. don't care about New York. Right? I know. I got to be better about that. But I have some cool stories. What can I say? Well, I don't know. What can't you say? Mm. Not much. I know. Not you, much. Nothing stories about no, New oh, York. Oh, here we go. Dude, oh. we don't care about New York. Avengers, yeah, yeah. Avengers uh, t-shirt and everything. Fellow geek. All right, oh, I'm already at least he had this. the headset, so he couldn't hear anything we were saying. It wasn't being broadcast oh, all over. Thank God! Thank God! <laughs> I kind of love that my uh, that my superhero T-shirts have now sort of become like my work attire, oh, where yeah. I can get away with having like what I would have been wearing anyway. Like now, uh, still be appropriate in my 40s. Right? So, well, you know, this is what I do. <laughs> I know. That's so I am. I have so many of those T-shirts, and my wife's like, "We really have to get rid of some." And I'm like, "Okay, I'll go up there." I'm like, "Well, I'm not getting rid of my Fallout T-shirt, or my Grendel T-shirt, or my Sandman T-shirt." And I'm like, "Okay, I got rid of one, you know, some old just because <laughs> it had a giant tiny. hole in the middle." <laughs> yeah, like eventually, like get to a point where some of them have just been worn down to the point where they're not useful anymore. But I. I I have a closet full of ones that I don't wear anymore, but I still can't bring myself to part with. Oh, so cool, them. though. You have, like, this T-shirt of, you know, maybe a first edition T-shirt of this old Batman comic book or whatever. First edition T-shirt? Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that you've never, that somebody, that somebody hasn't, you know, like a 70s T-shirt type thing. I have some. Vintage. Uh, yeah, vintage. Yeah. Anyway, you don't want to get rid of them. They're old. And not only that, the older they are, the better they feel. Just, I just yeah. did a count on all my t-shirts, all my Star Wars t-shirts. I can literally wear a Star Wars t-shirt every day for 36 days and not wear the same one twice. <laughs> You're a freak. And that's, that's just Star that's Wars. I'm talking <laughs> Avengers and Captain America and all that other stuff. That's just Star Wars. Like uh, yeah, I think if I just did month. superheroes, I could do superheroes for at least a month before oh, I yeah. had to eat. That's great. That's great. kind of becomes an obsession. Yeah. Trying to find the newest one, the nicest one. The coolest one. I know they're so cool. I love them. Well, hey Chad, I don't know if you noticed, but we have Peter Brown on the, on the show. I was gonna say I didn't know who this guy was. It was uh, just during the conversation. I gotta tell you, sir, um, <laughs> we've been t we've been talking about you probably since the beginning uh, when we started the show. Um, yeah. My wife got me into your books, and I devoured them. And um, I've been telling Chad about it, and um, and it was like a like a a wishful list that we had and um i'd seen you um, i think you were at, at Worldcon or at emerald city comic con uh you were on a panel with with my friend shannon mcguire and um, i've just fell in love with all your stuff um and it was great to hearing you talk hearing you talk and um so i told chad you gotta listen to this no, I'll you read. said you got to read Sorry, it. I'm read not it. a big reader right that's I'm the not, that i was getting at i have a hard well, time you can listen reading. to them too yes right. and then so Luis was such a gentleman. He gave me his uh, his password and everything for his Audible account, and he says, "Listen to it." And I said, "Oh, so for well, I think it's ten hours for the Eight, book. Eighteen right? hours is eighteen. Okay, yeah, it's eighteen hours. So two and a half days at work. That's oh, all I listen to Pete, for eight hours. And that's, a day. And that's the Pete Bradbury, Pete Bradbury narrator. 
Yeah. Pete Bradbury he's is so, amazing. He's so good. Oh, yeah. It's I like met him this like, week. And I got so mad. I'm like, okay, at the end of the book, I'm like, oh, that asshole. Okay, where's the second? It's not on there. I'm like, oh, shit. Now yeah. I'm just sitting, That's waiting for it to like, come out. I have like four different accounts. You have my old account. Gee, thanks. Give me the old one. Yeah. Hey, I'm not going to give you my, my new one. Have you spent my, my credits? So, I did. I yeah, audible credits are like gold. You don't I know. <laughs> I have four. They're burning a freaking hole in my pocket. But yeah, uh, the... The Audible, it's so it's such a key thing to have a good narrator, and I think Pete Broberry is just, just the right amount of uh, drama, and it just makes it really fun. Is that something you look for? You actually have any input into uh, who does the narrating, or is that the company? Well, I mean, it, when I first got published in my absolute naivete, I volunteered to do my own audiobook. Oh. And, and recorded books very gamely, like, allowed me to come into the sound studio and do, like, a sound check. And, uh, you know, while I was doing it, I was like, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> and they, uh, they, but they were super nice about it. And then afterward, they were like, yeah, we're going to use this Broadway actor. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind? And, I mean, because when I was a kid, I listened to the Dark Tower audiobooks. Oh, my God. And Stephen King narrated them himself. And he was bad. not the best narrator, yeah. but it was Stephen King. You know, and it, it, like the fact that it was the author of the book narrating the book, like, has an impact. Exactly. And so I was like, I could do bad narration. But, like, <laughs> uh, then I listened to Pete's performance, and he's just, he's amazing. Uh -huh. And, like, he, he doesn't try and do accents. He doesn't try and, like, you know, do, like, a falsetto voice for women or, or, or anything. But he makes these, like, subtle changes in yes. his, like, tone mm -hmm. and the way he speaks where you can tell who's speaking at any given time right. based on these little tiny changes. And it's just... So, like, he could do a piece of dialogue without, like, a dialogue tag at the end, and you'll know who's speaking. But he doesn't go over the top about it. So it's sort of like, you know, your grandpa reading you a book by the fire. And it's just... Exactly, yes. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, finish that thought, and I was I was gonna. No, I I was just gonna time. say that um, that subtlety that you mentioned is key. You can hear uh, a narrator that goes over the top, and sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think that that makes it that much more impressive. That it's just a subtle thing, and it doesn't take you away from the from the story itself because you're listening you know what i mean if if this guy's just going yeah. over the top you're going oh my god what's he doing there as opposed to being that subtle and you can listen to you just get lost and you're inside the book it, it's just amazing anyway yeah um i work with another company called graphic audio are you familiar with them no so they're not on audible which is the the downside mm -hmm. but it's, it's it's an independent company they cater mostly to like long haul truckers. A lot of their CDs are available in like truck stops, and they do like a complete audio play. So uh, they do my books, and they have a total like a complete cast. Like there's a different actor playing every character. I was just and, gonna ask. And that. they have sound effects, and they have music. So like in the books where like there'll be like a bunch of lyrics to a song, they'll set it to music and perform the song. Wow. When the demons show up, like and I, you know, I would write in the book like, oh, the demon shrieked. They have like different sound effects for each kind of demon. So like the rock demon sounds different from the wind demon, sounds different from the wood demon, and like the performances are amazing. And like they sat down and talked to me about like how I want all the accents to sound and like what you know how the accent from this town should be different from the accent from that town. And as the actors like settled into the roles, like I think that it's just become it's like transcended anything I ever expected it to be. It seemed kind of ho hokey at first, but like they're really good. <laughs> and so it, it, it's the tagline of graphic movie. audio, mm -hmm. the graphic audio tagline is uh, it's a movie in your mind. Oh, of course. Of course. Well, and that's like so, old timey radio. It was always yeah. theater of the mind where yeah. you'd listen to them and there'd be performances, you know, someone walking in, they take shoes and clap them on the table and make it sound like they were walking or yeah. breaking something. I mean, I'd actually, we did a play like that whenever I went to college because the three of us in the play pretty much didn't know our lines. And we were trying to read from script, and we just didn't have time with all our classes going on to do this half-hour presentation. So we decided to make it look like we were doing an old-time radio play while we were doing this scene. And we were reading our script because we didn't know our lines. Yeah, and that was, it played That's into it. That's brilliant, actually. Yeah, <laughs> we, we pulled it off, and then finally, after we got our grades, 
the teacher goes, so what was on the paper you guys were up there? Was that, you know, just they didn't know that was our scripts. We didn't know our lines. <laughs> After we already got our final grade. So we had you know, the teacher. But yeah, I've always liked old timey radio. And I'm not the kind of guy that doesn't like spoilers because you can explain to me everything about the movie or about the story. And I'm going to create a, my own image in my head. So if, then when I go see a movie or read the story, certain things are going to change, especially in movies. The way I depicted it happening is going to be different than the way that, say, the director decided to make sure. it do. So sure. I don't mind spoilers. It's kind of give me an idea of where, it, where it's going. And that's just me. Yeah. Depends on the nature of the spoiler. Like sometimes when it's it's something that, that retroactively changes how you would react to right. stuff. Like those are the things that are yeah. like... Yeah, like, I, like I, I, at the end of that, didn't I didn't really, you know, I didn't spoil it for me. Or Passion of the no, Christ. No, the boat was going to sink. Yeah, or Passion of the Christ. Dude, they, they, they sacrificed, they crucified him at the end. You know, I didn't want to blow it for everybody. You know, spoiler alert. Yeah. But that's how that goes. So that, that, do we hear that um, your story has been purchased for a, to make a movie or a TV show? Is that is that true? I mean, yes and no. Like, like it's been optioned. <laughs> Option, yeah. So optioned means that like there's a production company that has the rights to market the book, and if they can sell it to a studio, then wow. they have the rights to to produce it into a movie. And so, and it, it, it's been optioned before. I had. Um, Paul Anderson, who directed like the Resident Evil movies and mm -hmm. Death Race and, right. and Event Horizon, he optioned the books uh, in like 2009, and uh, they came very close to making a movie. They like he was really into the idea, and he just couldn't get a big studio to fund it because you need somebody to be like, yes, I'm going to spend a hundred million dollars and take a chance on this, you know, working. And none of the big studios wanted to do it, and so he tried to privately fund it. And they needed like, you know, their minimum was like fifty six million to do all the special effects and everything, and they got, you know, seventy percent of that, and then just couldn't, you know, like from like so private, close. and they got close, and they just so it sort of fell apart, and then the option expired. Um, but I was at a different part of my career then, you know, like I hadn't hit the times list yet. I hadn't, like, it was only like book two wasn't even out yet, and so like no one had heard of me and so no studio was really interested in something they had never heard of um, but then a few years later this other company has picked up the option and uh, they're shopping it right now and they have a they have an amazing presentation for like what they would do they wanted they're looking to do a TV series mostly yes That's the best and way so like they're shopping around they seem like they're getting a lot of interest but I've learned in this business when you're dealing with Hollywood, like just don't get too excited because you don't, don't hold your breath. It, 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 even if it does happen, it'll take forever before it actually happens. Exactly. And, and, and like, if you start having Hollywood dreams prematurely, like you're only gonna get let down. <laughs> and crying. like, I have the wonderful benefit that like my career has already like so far exceeded what I ever imagined that it would be. That like, yeah, if there's a movie, it's great. <laughs> Everything but if else not, is, like, is gravy. <laughs> yeah, like even if there's never a movie, like all my bills are paid, I'm I'm doing all right. Like, yeah. like, but like, so it's a good place to be in, and I'm hopeful right now that like I think there's getting real traction, so I think we have a good chance. But you yeah. know, we'll see. I Definitely. think the story would would play better as a TV series than I do a movie. I'm trying to shove everything into. Two, two hours, two and a half hours. I just think it'd be too much. I mean, you could do a series and just run with it. Well, yeah, big exactly. fantasy books exactly. are definitely suited better to TV. Yeah, definitely. Like Sh Shannara Chronicles that Terry Brooks wrote. Right. That's, I mean, when I first heard that was coming out, I was so excited. And then I saw it was on MTV and I'm like, oh man, just shit on my dreams right there. It's and then very I talked different from the books. Is it? Yeah, yeah well, know, yeah, it's, this all takes place ahead of uh, Shay. This is Will, his uncle, when he was kind of growing up and everything. Yeah. And, I mean, I met Terry Brooks, and he was excited when I brought him. I had an original first edition, first print of the, the uh, Source of Shannara. And he looked at it, and he goes, this thing's been through the ringer. I said, I know. I've had it since I was 12 yeah. and just waiting for you to sign it. And he's like, oh, my God, I love it. He goes, I like seeing books like this. It means they've been used. Right. And love. I saw the, the show, and I, was, I go, I was telling him, at, we were at Jet City Comic Con when we were mm -hmm. talking to him. And I was like, I was so excited when I saw you, your series was coming out because I've been waiting for it because it's been optioned for movies and he's always has the caveat Forever. that 
I will be retaining creative rights over it. And they said, no, we got someone to do it. And he pulls it away. He says, no, then we're not doing it. So MTV said, no, you do what you do. You wrote the story. You know the story. You have at it and go. And I was so excited. Then I saw it was on MTV and I kind of got scared. And I told him that. And he goes, yeah, but they let us have full autonomy. Right. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. And then I can't wait for season two. I mean, I'm sitting yeah. to wait for it. It's not till November. And I'm like, oh, come on, hurry up. This is like worth waiting for on Game of Thrones to show up. I had almost an identical interaction with Terry Brooks the first time I met him. <laughs> I, uh, so I met him at New York City Comic Con. I had just, like my book had just come out. And, um, or, no, it hadn't even come out yet. We just had the, the advanced read copies. And uh, Betsy Mitchell, Terry's editor, was going to introduce us. And she's like, you know, this will be your opportunity to ask him to read the book and give you a blurb. And so, like, the time came, and, like, I was, like, you know, <laughs> like, fixing my hair. And, and so, like, I, like I, she introduces me to him. And instead of me being like, hi, I'm an author, too, and, you know, here's my book, I, I was just like, oh, my God, will you sign my Elfstone to Shannara? So I pull out this beat-up paperback, and he, like, opens it up, and he goes, first edition. And I was like, I bought it when it came out. And, like, he, he had the same thing. It's like, look, this book has been loved. Like, I can tell. And, and, like, so we had that almost that exact same interaction. This was years before the TV show was on the map, though. And then he gave me an amazing blurb for The Warded Man, which, like, I'm eternally grateful for. That was, like, and when, when we were shopping the book around, we had three different publishers that had offered, that made offers on the series. And they were all offering about the same amount of money. And one of the main reasons that I chose Del Rey is because they're Terry Brooks's publisher, and I was a huge Terry Brooks fan. <laughs> that's what's cool that Terry Brooks lives here in Washington, up in Burien, and that's why the Shannara Chronicles, all the Shannara books, here. takes place in Seattle. Right. And that's what I thought was really cool. And then I, I mean, he's a local guy that made it big, and I've been reading his books since I was like 12, 13 years old. And I was just like, I don't. I felt like a nerd. I started to geek out on him right there. Yeah, you just And he's all shaking it. and smiling. And I'm like, uh huh. And then he started talking to me about the show and Manu Bennett and all that. And I'm like, oh, Crixus from Spartacus, yes. He goes, as al and I go, I figured al was really, you know, going to be a little bit taller. And he goes, yeah, so did I until I saw Manu Bennett play the character. And he goes, yeah, he, he was, he was great. Battle Druid? This, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. So, I mean, like, the question is, like, like al ages, like, pretty hard over the first few books right. uh -huh. like like the more he uses magic the like the older he gets and so he starts out like in the beginning of Elstones, he's still got like dark hair and he's like ready to fight with a sword and then by by the end of like wish song he's like a like a withered old right. man yeah. yep so like i'm wondering how that's going to play out like yeah. visually you know, on the show that'll look good uh, i think we're right at the, at the perfect age of of tv and uh like you had mentioned the dark tower um, the the movies coming out, and I had heard. I'm still not sure if they're doing this, but I like the idea uh, that I heard from um, that they were going to do that they would have the main storyline go into different mo multiple movies, but then have a TV show that follows along to because of Wizard and Glass, how it's a a, uh, a different story, basically different characters because they're they're the younger version of Roland, oh, different actors, yeah, right, and then have Wizard and Glass as a TV show that'll follow in between movies so you can go watch the first movie then one season of, of this show I thought it was brilliant and I don't I, if anybody will look for two seconds at Game of Thrones at Shannara uh, all these fantasy uh, books I've been turning to TV shows and with Netflix and Amazon they can do anything and they have yeah. like complete auto autonomy as to what they do, it would be, it's silly that they don't jump on, on books like yours and, um, and start doing them. And, uh, you know, we're ready. We're, we're, we're kids, I'm ready. Man, we have money yeah. and we will spend it, <laughs> you know, come on. And uh, I, I loved so much the whole idea of the worded man. And um, it's just, it's one of my favorite stories. And that's why Thank Ted you. and I have been geeking out about it for the longest time when we finally we're able to get a hold of you. We're like, dude, Peter Brett. I would have done this ages ago. Oh, man. Now he tells us. No. <laughs> well, you're always welcome. You're always welcome. But uh, looking at your background, I got a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, sure. You, that it says that you live in Brooklyn, New York, or near Brooklyn? Uh, right now, I live in Manhattan. I did, I've lived in Brooklyn for 17 years. And so uh, uh -huh. I guess in my earlier author blurbs, right. it said Brooklyn, but that was... 
Correct that. I was I was yeah. born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I lived. Oh, there here we go with the New York stories. I know, but Jesus. then you the went. People to the... said they don't want to hear this. All right, Shut man, up. you got hate mail on it. Shut Our up. first hate mail was that Luis talks too much, <laughs> tells stories too much. But he says that that uh, you went to univers University of Buffalo, and uh, True. that was uh, I lived in Buffalo for most of my oh, life. There we go. Yeah, see, told you. So Got to bring that up have, every show. Do yeah. you have good memories or bad memories of your time in Buffalo? I mean, like, I, I was in college. I have great memories of college, right. and I liked the University of Buffalo a lot. Like, um, I didn't have a car in college, and like the Buffalo and the the campus is somewhat Pretty, isolated. So, yeah. like, I I wasn't uh, in Buffalo proper like a lot. Uh, uh, the winters bad. were freaking harsh. Ah, like brutal. I mean, like, it, 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 it's fun now because, like, people complain about winter in New York, and I'm like, you guys don't fucking know. That. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I, you never jumped out of a two-story win uh, window into, like, a snowdrift. They, like, they don't believe it. Uh, my my mom called me about eight years ago. She's, she calls me. It's uh, the day before New Year's Eve. Uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Christmas Eve. And she tells me, oh, my God, honey, it hasn't snowed at all it's so beautiful outside mom you never ever ever want that you want snow to fall it's just gonna dump and no kidding less than 24 hours later they had something like six and a half feet of snow the next day they had another six and a half feet of snow and there's like a top of houses it, it, everything got shut down for like two weeks no power which you never want in buffalo to have no power mm -hmm. uh, you'll freeze to death and it was just unreal. And people don't understand. It. It's like, oh, yeah, here in Seattle, you get half an inch of snow. And, and people shit themselves. Yeah, there's like the apocalypse. Everybody's, oh, my God. People are know, abandoning cars on the freeway children. and walking. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it's horrible. In Buffalo, like, if there's four feet of snow, that's okay. just Monday. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, that's, like, like they're... they're they are so ready for it yeah. that, like, like what we would consider like like a like a like a snowstorm that would stop New York City in its tracks is nothing in Buffalo. Like yeah. they're they're like prepared for it, and like like it's just life as usual. Like within an hour, like you know, like whereas here, like if we get a you know two feet of snow, like New York shuts down for a couple of days. Yeah, but crazy. in Buffalo, I would remember like there'd be days where there's like six feet of snow, and I'd be like, oh, I guess school's canceled. And they're like, nope, nope. But yeah, yeah, there's no. Snow we've already this. clouded. Like, yeah. yeah, you get a half inch here in Washington, anywhere on the west side of Washington, and it's basically snowmageddon. Yeah, that yeah. everything's shut down. Everything now the east side, they're like, oh, that's you know two inches of snow. So what? But yeah. over here on the west side, they freak out, and no one knows how to drive, and it's it's horrible. I agree. It's like when I lived in San Diego, when it rains down there, people freak out. Just like when it snows up here, people freak out because they don't know how to drive in the rain down in San Diego, and it's. It's comical. I mean, it's fucking water on the road. Just don't drive like an asshole, and you're fine. Yeah, Same thing time. in the snow. Yeah. You take your People don't seem to forget that. Common sense. It's a goddamn superpower anymore. <laughs> so, Seriously. So I also heard, obviously, through uh, because of your T-shirt, I can see that you're totally into comics. What uh, What's your favorite? Uh, you're a Marvel man, I take it. I mean, why do we got to label? People I read them all when I was a kid. I would say that, you know, like if I had to choose, I was more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy. Um, I think that Marvel had a much more of a human element to its stories than, than DC Comics did. Um, and they were much more like progressive in a lot of ways. And, and so like my entry point into comics was X-Men. No, yes. And then I went from X-Men to uh, New Mutants. And then um, I started reading comics like right before the first Marvel Secret Wars. And so, like, the X-Men went into that portal and, like, got kidnapped. And I was like, what happened? I've got to find out. And I went and I bought Secret Wars. And, like, it was brilliant at the time. Like, now it, the crossovers have become irritating. But, like, Annoying. at the time, that first, at that first issue of Secret Wars, like, um, Jim Shooter, the, the author, was, like, opened it up with, like, all right, let's line up all the superheroes. And we're going to just introduce every single one of them and tell you what their deal is. And so, suddenly, like my very uh, focused comic interest became broadened massively. So and so by the, the by the time I was done reading Secret Wars, I was also reading The Hulk and The Avengers and Francis IV and, and you know, like, and everything. <laughs> they suck um, you in. Spider-Man, like, as soon as, that was when Spider-Man, like, started with the black costume, and so, like, I went out and, like, started reading Spider-Man, and then, like, and there's, like, 18 different Spider-Man comics, yeah. and I started those and, and so 
but but then I just hit a saturation port where I was reading all of the Marvel comics and still had tons of reading time, and that's when I started branch out into DC. And so like uh, pretty much any superhero comic that came out like in the eighties, I read. <laughs> yeah, I read. <laughs> okay, um, good stuff. And then in, in, in like then I like stopped for a little while. Like I started dating. I stopped reading comics for like <laughs> years. A life. <laughs> and then I came back to it in college around when Image Comics started. Yes. And, like, right on the ground floor on Image Comics and read all the Image books. And that sort of drew me back into a lot of the Marvel stuff, too. And then I started reading a lot of independent comics. Um, I mean, these days, like, I've hit a point where, like, I'm just freaking busy and, like, don't get to read as much as I would like to. But there's still a few books that I make a point of reading every month. Like, Invincible. I'm still reading Invincible. Oh, it's amazing. Course. Oh, you ever thought yeah, of, um, image, image was a game changer when it came to the comics, though. Absolutely. I mean, they stepped up with Digital Chameleon and printed on a heavier stock paper, nicer looking paper, and it wasn't newsprint now. And I think that is what kind of changed it for me. Is like, wow, the colors are popping off the page, and the artwork was a number one at the time. And then they started, you know, everyone started kind of following suit with them, printing it on nicer paper and going digital and all that. And I was just like, yep, this shit's gonna get expensive. And it went, from, you know, my first comic, I think, was 35 cents for a single <laughs> issue. And my most, exp- I remember the very first comic I ever bought. It was $1. It was a first issue, number one, giant size G.I. Joe. Mm. And I still have that one. And my aunt was like, I'm not paying a dollar for a comic book. And well, yeah, she did because I got it. And because that was my aunt and how she did it. And I still have that one. And I looked at all the others after it and I'm like, well, these are only 35 cents. I can spend my milk money on it now and not have milk at school. And okay, that's what I'm doing. I'm saving up my milk money all week long to go buy comics at the 7-Eleven around the corner from my mom and dad's house. And that's what I did. Lunch money and milk money, I was buying comics and losing weight. (laughs) Mine was uh, Vertical uh, vertical Comics. Um, I started way late with the DC. I saw, uh, I came way late. And so all the 70s and 80s comic books it just seemed too childish for me. It was, I just didn't get it. And I, I can see how they're cool. And, um, but it just didn't do it for me. I liked all the Frank Miller stuff. Um, obviously Daredevil and all the stuff. Obviously I was handed Watchmen, the Dark Knight Returns and all these other stuff. And I just got totally hooked. But then I, I saw the Vertigo comics that, you know, you have Sandman and Preacher and stuff like that, that it's completely a different type of, of comic book and it's like for adults and this is you know very compelling uh storyline and and uh and funny and just horrific to look at it's like uh garth ennis and his you know preacher it's like quentin tarantino in for yeah. comic books and i just i absolutely love that and um that's what got me into comic books and the, and the freak that i am today um with them but yeah that's great i love that you know origin story have you ever thought of or have been approached to to make the warden man a comic book uh i've been approached and i've thought about it um and it's like it's sort of in the works oh. so like when i with the oh. latest with the latest um dad boner the latest <laughs> media option they bought the comic book rights as well oh, i had this plan to make my i had this plan to independently make a, a demon cycle comic book series and I want I had I even had the artist um, my uh, Dominic Broniak who's my uh, illustrator in Poland sure. is incredible right. his, his illustrations are amazing and so he's already illustrated the whole series and like it, it's sort of like one art influences the other because like I hired an artist to do portraits of a bunch of my main characters right in the beginning of my career because I wanted to set down a template for what they look like before publishers started using like, you know, carte blanche to do whatever they wanted. I wanted to be like, this is what they look like per the books. And so I hired an artist and I did the commission and I sat down and was like, okay, we're going to be very specific about their appearances so that I can then show these images to other people. And so Dominic saw some of those and he also like came up with some of his own stuff for the demons and how they look that, you know, has then gone on to influence other publishers work and other pieces of fan art. And like it all has be- like fits into each other. Sure. Yeah. And so his work is so good and so influential. And now at this point, because 
when a new book comes out, he'll he'll send me a letter and be like, "Hey, what can you suggest some things that I should illustrate?" And then he'll send me his sketches and be like, "Hey, can you give me an idea of like what I'm getting wrong or, or what you like?" Critique them. And so, because I have that influence, I can make sure that we make little corrections so that it's accurate to what's in the story. And I just love working with him. And so my plan is to do a comic book with him. And I asked him, I was like, "Hey, have you ever?" Um, thought about doing comics and he's like well actually I got into the illustration business because I wanted to do comics oh, yeah. but doing book illustrations just paid more money but he's like if you ever want to do a comic I'll definitely do a comic with you and oh. so I had that plan and I was going to do it independently like after I finished this series um, but then the latest media option bought the comic book rights and then the plan was that they had a, a comic company that they would be working with um, in tandem with doing other media stuff um, and so that part of the deal has sort of languished a little bit, sure. which is fine because I don't have time to write it right now. And <laughs> I, I, I don't trust anybody else to write it. No. So um, it wouldn't okay. sound the same. It wouldn't be the same if someone else kind of took over just the idea and started running with it. Well, I mean, I guess if they were retelling the, the, the books that I've already done and they, and they had like were faithful to it, like I, it's not like someone couldn't do it, but like, I love comics. I want to write it, you know? Yeah. And so uh, it's still it's still in the works. I'm hoping to do it at some point, but right now, like, I'm ending my series, and that's sort of been where my main priority is. Um, but at some point, I will, I've got one book left on my contract, and then I'm sort of creatively free. And so, I don't know. It's in the works. I plan to do it. I want to do it. I know how to have the artist down. It's going to be awesome. When is that uh, schedule, the, the last book in the series? The last book in the series is coming out in October. It's done. Oh, and, then I have, and then I have one book left on my contract that is sort of whatever I want it to be. Right. Um, and so I could do another Demon Cycle book. I have, a, I have an idea for a standalone book that's not really – that takes place like, you know, Shannara style, like 15 years after nice. the, the series ends. So it won't affect – um, the conclusion of this series so I could do that or I have some ideas for some new stuff like it's I have this one like a brief moment where I can do whatever I want after the last 10 years of like slogging away on this one big series freedom <laughs> so do you remember do you remember the the moment where you came up with the idea of the warded man and how it came about I um, was taking a fantasy novel writing class at NYU it was like a NYU continuing education, like nighttime class. And I was just doing it like as a hobby after work. I had been, I was writing a different book at the time. It was a much more standard sort of D and D fantasy book. And, um, so I sort of wanted help with that cause I was hitting some, some walls, uh, because I'd never really been professionally trained as a writer. Like I just did it as a hobby. So I started taking this writing class, and the teacher, like, on the first day, was like, you're probably working on a book. I'm not interested. Don't bring it to class. <laughs> Don't show it to us. We're not going to critique it. Everything you do in this class has to be new. And I was like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll play along. And um, one of our homework assignments was write the first chapter of a new fantasy novel. And so, like, I, in standard Peter Brett fashion, I waited until the night before it was due, and I <laughs> stayed up super late like writing this little story and it was this little um, short story about a boy named Arlen who uh, had never been more than half a day's walk from his house because he always had to be home behind the wards before the demons come out at night and it was like this little standalone story where like you know he like he goes on this walk and like stands on top of the hill and like looks out at like places that he'll never ever get to and then he has to run home before the sun sets and then he like watches the demons rise and you can actually read it on my website if you go to my website there's a tab that says excisions that's like stuff that's been cut out of the books and there's the the prologue to the warded man which we stayed in the book almost until the end and then we cut it like right before the book was published oh, wow. that's that's almost verbatim my original uh short story um but then it was years before I got back to it. Like, that was 1999 I wrote that. Wow. And then I went back to the fantasy series that I was already working on and sort of put another couple of years' work into that and tried to sell that, and it didn't 
fly. And so then I went back to the, the warded man, which I'd been sort of, had been percolating in the back of my head for a couple of years. And then I wrote that and that didn't sell. <laughs> and then, uh, but it got me the attention of an agent who was like, no, you could make this into something that will sell. And so I rewrote it and then I finally got through. So I wrote probably four books before I wrote something that was good enough to publish. Oh, wow. Um, Damn. I mean, every professional author that I know sure. has a couple of books they wrote. They're, they're practice books. Some of them go and publish them anyway, and I think that's probably a mistake. I was just going to ask, is that something that you revisit? I'm like, oh, maybe I'll change here and there and try to publish no. it again, or you just leave it? I mean, like, like there, there's a lot in those books that I'm proud of. There's a lot in those books that I think is really good. But I was an amateur writer at the time. There's also a lot of really, like, basic stakes in them and like at the end of the day it's it's the story of like a ranger and his wizard friend and like they're you know they're like companion the thief and they like encounter like elves and dwarves and, and like i made the magic system my own i like tweaked you know like i spelled elves differently so that like <laughs> it's not the same <laughs> <laughs> completely different but, but at the end of the day like it was it was a much it was like it was more of a forgotten realms book than it was something unique and creative like the warded man is and so it's not that they're bad but the amount of work it would take me to fix them to get them to what i consider a professional level like i might as well just write a whole new book you know so i don't know i i think it's a mistake to try and publish that old nostalgia writing because you're only as good as your last book if i go and put out right. something that's not at the quality level that i'm working at now like that's not going to get me any readers like um, that makes sense. That makes well, sense. you did inspire me for my Halloween costume this year. I was going to go as the painted man, the warded man. And I'm like, no one's going to get that except maybe Luis. <laughs> None of my friends would understand what I was. You're like, dude, you're a monk with tattoos? I'd be yeah, like, you're, kind you're, of do it. Yeah, you're a walking Give your head. advertisement. You know? Oh, never thought about that. There have been a so, few amazing warded man cosplays. Uh, some for Halloween, some for like uh, Comic Cons and, and things like that that are just amazing so how did it come about changing the name or the name gets swapped between warded man and painted man the original story is called the warded man probably means that's how else. you wrote the it? original story was called the painted man my, okay. my original book was called the painted man and when i sold it it was the painted man. Uh, um and i sold it in the u.s and then i sold it in the uk and u.s publishers take longer to get a book out they usually takes them around nine months to a year to get a book out like you give them a finished book and like between editing and production and marketing and whatever they like a lot of lead time before the book actually comes yeah. out in the uk they work a lot faster yeah i saw and there's so, like a six month difference between when the first one came out in in england and then six months later like in march of 98 yeah. or whatever came out here so uh the u.s told me they're like look you know we think we're going to change the title and at that point in my career, like I, I wasn't in a position to argue, and I like I kind of, like I was attached to the title, but I also was like so stoked to like have sold my book that like I was like okay, okay well, you know we'll change the title, and, and so they asked me to suggest a bunch of alternate titles, and I gave them a list of, like no shit ninety nine options for titles, <laughs> like some of them were really good, some of them were just spitballing, and the Warded Man was one of them. But they didn't. They couldn't decide, and they, you know, they wanted to call it Nightfall. But Nightfall is like the name of like a like an old uh, science fiction story, yeah, yeah. and like um, there was no like legal problem with calling it Nightfall. But like my agent was like really, really against the idea of like naming it after like an Isaac Asimov story or whatever. Right. And so um, there was all this back and forth over what the title should be. And the UK was like, look, we want to print the book. Like, we're ready to go. Can we just use The Painted Man? And so I was like, yeah, I love that title. Like, there's no reason not to. I don't really know why, to this day, I don't really know why uh, Random House didn't like The Painted Man as a title. Like, I have my suspicions, but, like, I wasn't privy to the meeting where they decided they couldn't use it, and most of the people who were don't work there anymore. So, like, <laughs> the world may never know. Um, uh -huh. So the Painted Man came out in the UK and it sold really well. Like it, it made some bestseller lists and uh, it was doing great. 
and so we went back to Random House and we're like, hey, you know, the book's doing great. Maybe we should just go with the Painted Man. And they're like, no, we're going to do Warded Man. And so, like, and that was fine. Like, I like the Warded Man title, too. I, I suggested it. Uh, and so, like, on one hand, like, it was fine. But, like, I feel like if they, like, if you just made that decision a couple of months ago, we could have all yeah. had the same title. And now the, the, the book was getting such good reviews and such good marketing in the U.K., that and that like it was frustrating to have to start over with the mark because they changed the cover too and wow. so the the two books looked nothing like each other and i had to basically start the marketing machine all over again uh, instead of being able to piggyback off the great reviews and the great marketing that the book was already getting um and so i think that like it probably set my career back a year or two in the u.s it's which like is a shame. Yeah, it's like publishing two books, and, you know. Yeah. Especially now with the internet and whatnot, people will be looking. Oh, I heard of this painted man. Let's look for that. Oh no, there's this other warded man. Let's, you know what I mean? Every Why once in a while, I get an angry email from somebody who bought both, thinking it was another. <laughs> book. And I'm just like, look, you know, I like this decision Sorry. was made above my pay grade. <laughs> like I don't. Uh, well, I'm uh, I'm introducing a new segment to our to our show and it's called uh alisa's questions because uh alisa is my wife and she <laughs> and she really wanted to be on the show and talk to you but uh she gave me a couple of questions um she first of all she wanted to know would you can, can you use a different voice when you ask questions for her please can she just come over and sit I behind the mic? i can't she sounds like a like a puerto rican lady no you, she you don't want jesus that. she does not sound puerto rican you do that's what i'm saying numb nuts so, oh. <laughs> um, so she wanted to know: Is this Earth in the future? Is this is this basically the 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 thought is that this might be what's coming? This is it like like not unlike the Dark Tower. This it's a world that has moved on, and it's something else. Is this related to our world? I am not at liberty to say. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, so, and it's not it's not like an agreement with like the movie people or anything i just like i don't i know the answer to that question it's a good question it's a question that like i was deliberately vague in the story because i wanted there to be that question uh, just an but i think but i think that it's more powerful to never say it. i uh, think that there are people who are convinced that it's our world and view the whole story through that lens and there are people who just see it as like a, you know, a second world story and see it through that lens. And I don't want to ruin the illusion for either one of them. And so, like, I like the fact that there are questions in the, in the story that are just never answered. You know, like, is there, a, you know, like, is there a creator? Like, is there a God in the series? Like, sure. there's a lot of people who believe there is. There's a lot of people who believe there isn't. There's never any proof one way or the other. Like, is there a deliverer? Like, is somebody like, you know, like, is there one person who actually is the chosen one who's meant to save the world? There's never going to be any proof. Like, it's right. always like what you believe and how you interpret what happened. And some people are going to go away from the series thinking there is. And some people are going to go away from the series thinking that, like, you know, the right person at the right time just made the right decision. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, like, God set it up that way. Right. I, and I, I, I like that ambiguity. Right. I like that about Arlen that everybody's like, oh, he's the deliverer, and he's doing it's like, no, man, I just tattooed my body because I don't want to die, and I just, I can fight these demons. That's all there is. You, you know, take it however you want. I'm just a guy, and I yeah. love that about him. He's like, you know, doesn't pay any attention to that. Yeah, it's great. Gosh, I just love those books so much. The other thing is um, um, she wanted to know what, if there was what inspired gave you the inspiration to use what seems to us like a Middle Eastern uh, culture for the desert people. Obviously, they're in the desert and all that, but is, was there something in particular that drew you to that, to make the desert people more like our East, uh, Middle Eastern type of uh, communities? Well, the, the, the creation culture is an amalgam of a few things. Right. Um, at its core... It's more medieval Japanese than anything else, which is inspired in no small part by my uh, obsessive reading of uh, Lone Wolf and Cub and like, uh -huh. Shogun. And so, like, if you look at the way that their um, culture is set up, you have like the warrior class, 
like the samurai, right. who like have all of the have most of the secular power, and who like the the culture is very dependent on. And those who, those people who reach sharam status, you know, warrior status, have all of these privileges in the society that like everybody else doesn't have. And then you have the clerical class, who they're much smaller in number, but they have dominion over the the warrior class. But they're much more removed from day to day society. Um, and then you have the uh, Sharam Ka, who's like the shogun, and then you have the Andra, who's like the emperor, mm -hmm. and so like that whole, and, and then like you know you the kafit, even the kafit class, like the um, they're like the lower classes in in uh, medieval Japan, like like mimic, mimic that a lot, and that was all intentional. Um, and then you have uh, ancient Greece, like there was a lot that was inspired by like you know the hot gates. 300 and things like mm -hmm. that where spear fighting and the agogi where like the, the the young males are like pulled into this warrior training that's just brutal and like leaves a lot of them crippled and killed to like weed out the weak so that even your your average uh crazian soldier is just fucking bad yeah exactly you know? <laughs> um They've been, you know, because they've been getting like brutalized, like in their martial arts lessons their entire lives, and they've been like, because they need that to stand toe to toe with a demon with a with a regular non magical spear and and come out of it alive, and so like the the whole culture is sort of like geared toward, look, we're in this nearly suicidal war, and we need to build people who are a you know able to handle it, and like, so. So there's a lot of that, and then like on top of that, I put the sort of Middle Eastern flavor right. of you know the the women are mostly covered, covered head to toe, and like the men wear turbans and and you know the, like some of the foods and things like that. But that is mostly just cosmetic. surface yeah. cosmetic, yeah. Um, and some of that like comes through with the religion. But the idea was to have this sort of like East versus West conflict that we could relate to, sure. but not to be able to point at any particular culture and be like, I'm talking about you, right. because that, I absolutely right. didn't want to do that. Right. So I wanted to have this sense of like, okay, we have a kind of Western culture, and you could argue whether it's um, US Western or like uh, UK Western, because like, when I think of it, I think of like, Tivitz Brook, where all comes from, as like Little House on the Prairie, mm. but like the UK readers, obviously, you know, it's more of the Shire, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and 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 I like that ambiguity. I like the fact that you can different readers can go into it and take it in the way that's most comfortable for them. And so I created this Western culture that was very relatable, regardless of, of the specifics. And then I created this Eastern culture that's an amalgam of a bunch of different cultures. But to get that dichotomy, so that when I had them come into conflict, that conflict would be something that's relatable. And then I deliberately show like sort of the Western side of it first and, you know, get the sense of like, oh, they're the bad guys. And then I like flip it second book where you get the perspective of like, you know, the leader of the Crasians from, from his childhood on and you realize like, oh, he's a hero too. And, exactly. and like when he encounters a problem, I want him to solve it because he's a good guy. And that I think really is, is what, if there's an overall statement to what I was doing is kind of this sense of like, it's really easy to demonize people that you don't know and don't it. understand. Yeah. But when you look at, when you see things from their perspective, you realize that like, you have more in common than you thought. Yeah. Um, and so that was my reasoning behind all of that. But I was very careful to make sure that like, there's no specific people that you can point to and say like, I'm talking about you. What I really did like is with Arlen, when he, at the end of the book, he's an outsider that's accepted, but to a point. You're still going to be an outsider. You're never going to be one of us. And that's always, that, that just kind of was held over his head the whole time. And I think yeah. that's what, the end of it, that's what pissed me off the most. Because I was like, God damn it, you should have seen that coming. <laughs> I was pissed. I was literally in our shop. And when that happened, I'm like, son of a, I yell, son of a bitch. And I have my yeah. headphones on and everything. Everyone kind of looks at me and I'm like, I'm just listening to a story. Don't mind me. Yeah. I, was all, I was literally pissed off. Like, God damn it. And I go, oh, shit, I should have seen that coming. That he was going to get, yeah. But, mm. 
Yeah. I like how he was never really accepted. He was accepted when they needed him. Right. He was like, it was, you're accepted to a point, but you'll never be one of us. You'll never be as good as any of us, even though you are better than all of us. And that's what I liked about it, that he always was, he never really fit in anywhere. Yeah. He was always outside. I mean, that's the thing. Like he was always, he was always so driven and focused that like he couldn't relax into any group without feeling like an outsider. And that's mm-hmm. what drove him to, to, go on to do the things that he did, you know, like, like you can't, you can't be that person. You can't be the person that changes the world. If you're content with the world, the way the world is and you fit in, yeah. it's just not words to live by right there. Yeah. Well, thank <laughs> never you be for, content. Thank you for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Is there anything you want to plug? I know your book is coming out in October. What was the date on that? Uh, so UK, October 28th, us, October, th- oh wait, UK, September 28th. Uh, UK October 3rd um, we have advanced read copies now and so like I'm holding a, a, I just finished a, a contest on my uh, blog for people to make dioramas from the books and uh, the, the best 10 we're going to get advanced read copies of the book and we got over 40 entries and they're all oh, fucking that's awesome. amazing and now I, like, and now also, I don't know how to and, pick and also podcasts right that's what I heard <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mean, I, I I could like, I could talk to the publisher. They might send you one. Oh, that would be uh, awesome. Like we, a would, review one. we would totally uh, promo promo it all over the place if you if you did. That would, that would be so awesome. Send me an address offline, and we'll. Uh, of course, of course. Thank you so much, man. Again, we are giant geeks. We're gonna be the day that comes out on on uh, hard copy and on audio. I'm gonna be the first dork to buy it. Um, and listen to it, and I'm so very much looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to your next the movie. Yeah, the and your TV next series, stage the of comic. Oh, everything, man. Uh-huh. Again, we'll we'll be all over that. And uh, again, huge fans, and um, we love you here at the uh, GTFO podcast. And um, I will tell my wife maybe she'll actually listen to one of these episodes. And um, <laughs> She doesn't even listen to us. No, but she said, <laughs> I'm going to listen to this one because she, she loves your stuff. Anyway, so you can say hi to Elisa real quick. It'll be great. I'll make her day. Hi, Elisa. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That. All right, hey, man. Come to the West Coast. Thank you so much, guys. Oh, no what was that? Seattle. Uh, you- I may be in Seattle um, on book tour, and I will definitely be at Seattle Comic Con next year. Uh, oh, oh. oh to, to Emerald City? Yeah. Oh. Is that? Do you guys not go to that? Yeah. I'll, every year. Every year. And uh, that's where I've, I've uh, the last couple of years, I've been in your panels uh, at Emerald City Comic Con. So I'll be, I'll be sure to Why come up. Why did you say and, something sooner? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I've, I've, I don't like, again, uh, I don't know if you've met Shannon McGuire. She's a good friend of ours. Sure. I've panels there a bunch of times. Exactly. She's just she's such a funny, funny person. But anyway, I don't, I try not to be too much of a you know fanboy and try to yeah. use that and whatnot but um i will definitely come in and say hi uh during uh, uh comic-con and uh looking forward to that too man i really appreciate it again thank I'll you i'll even so go much, this man. year yeah maybe emerald city is my new favorite con like, it is like out of out of all the comic cons because it's like it has all the stuff of a big of, of like the really big ones but it's not quite as like oppressively crowded like seattle, and the way the uh, seattle convention center goes up instead of out like you can keep different groups exactly. on different floors and so you don't get the extra con- congestion because like all the people who are just there to see Haley atwell are up on this exactly. floor and all the people who are into the book stuff are on this floor yep. and so like you're not it's not wall-to-wall people the way that new york comic-con or, or, or san, san diego, diego is yeah. oh, and i love i just too. love seattle seattle is like one of the few towns where awesome, i feel like right? I, I, I feel here. Yeah. Great, great to hear. Well, the good thing about, about Emerald City is the fact that it's not like San Diego Comic-Con. It's not saturated with all the, the movies and TV shows and all that other crap coming out, the pop culture stuff. It's they have really just about enough. Just, enough. Just, an, just a really? dash, just okay, a, okay. a little flavor, but it's not like SDCC, whereas that's pretty much all it is now is new movies coming out, and it's like, oh, God. Oh, but you gotta, I went to it once. Uh, you once. Gotta, yeah, I know. You got to check out on the second floor. It's all role-playing which I found out uh, last year, they have the uh, Magic the Gathering and also D&D. You just walk up and they have like seven or eight tables of DMs just waiting for you to sign up. You sit down and you play D&D. Oh, just jump right in. Oh, it's amazing, huh. amazing. All right, man. We'll see you at Emerald City Comic Con. And again, 
Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, guys. Right. Take care. Appreciate man. it. Had a great time. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Got your happy ending. Feel the excitement build. Showdown in.